Lecture 17, Project Management. So a project is a one-time operations designed to accomplish a specific set of, uh, of objectives in a specific time frame. So here's an example, the Olympic Games. So the Olympic Games, getting ready for the Olympic Games, having the Olympic Games, and, and finishing off, that is a project. It's, it's a single time. Producing a movie. So, from the, so to produce a movie, you do it once. It, it, you have a specific uh, budget, a specific schedule. Software development. So you're going to develop a piece of software. Uh, that whole process is, an, uh, is a project. Uh, a, a new product. Um, developing a new product and then ERP implementation. Let's say that you are going to implement ERP across your organization. That would be a project as well. So the nature of projects, projects goes through a series of state stages. Uh, it's called a life cycle. It brings people together with diverse knowledge and skills um, most of the people are only associated with the project for less than its full life. And then the organizational structure affects how projects are managed. So here's a typical project life cycle. You start with initiating. You start the project. And then you plan it. You, you plan the project. And then you go execute the project. You actually do the project according to the plan. And then you're monitoring and controlling. Is it, is it happening the way you planned? What changes need to be made? And then when you're all done, it's the closing of the project. So the project manager is ultimately responsible for the success or failure of the project. Um, the project manager must effectively manage the work, uh, the people, they must manage communications, manage quality, manage time, manage costs. So here's the project management triangle. So you have constant trade-offs between cost, schedule, or performance. Performance is what are you going to do. So as you try to do more and more, the cost goes up and the schedule gets longer. If you say, well, I need it shorter, I need it faster, uh, sometimes doing it faster uh, might increase cost. Sometimes the only way you can get it faster is by eliminate, eliminating some of your performance objectives. Uh, for example, you, you take your car into the shop to be repaired and they say there's 10 items that need to be fixed and it's going to cost you $1,000 and it's going to take two days. And, and it's like, well, is there anything I could not do right now? And, and so then they say, well, there's three things that have to be done now and I can have it done in an hour and that'll cost you $100. And so you're making that trade off. The other consideration is if you try to squeeze cost, squeeze schedule, and squeeze performance objectives, so you're trying to do too much, your quality starts to drop. If you're trying to do it really fast, really cheap, um, then your quality drops. Behavioral issues. So you can on a team, you can have behavioral problems and one of the one of the sources of those problems is decentralized decision making. Let's say you're in charge of a project, you go to your boss and your boss says, "Well, I don't know, let's go talk to so and so, talk to so and so." You when those decisions are decentralized, it 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 can um lead to behavioral problems. Yeah, the, the project manager can get frustrated, your boss can get frustrated, the team can get frustrated. And then that stress of achieving project milestones on time and on budget. So you're working on the project and something goes wrong. It's taking longer, it's costing more. 
there, that's a constant battle for a project manager. And then surprises. Uh, you thought that it, it was going to be easy to get this done and suddenly something hard crops up. So the team must be able to function as a unit. Um, interpersonal skills, coping skills, all of those are very important both for the project manager and people on the team. Conflict resolution negotiation is a critical part of the project manager's job. So conflict within the team and conflict external to the team where people say, well, we want this or we want that or we need this, we need this or we need it by this date. Resolving those con conflicts, finding a solution, that's an important part of the project manager's job. Avoiding problems. So many problems can be avoided or mitigated by effective team selection. If you're the project manager and it's an important project or if you're, if you're in charge of finding uh, a good team, the people on the team make a huge difference. Leadership. Uh, if are you leading the team effectively? How good is your leadership skills? Motivation. There's different types of motivation. How are the team members being motivated? Uh, and then maintaining that environment of integrity, trust, professionalism. Those things. How do you how do you operate professionally with trust? and then being supportive of team efforts. So when the team is working on something, if you support those efforts, you can avoid problems. Project champion. So a champion is a person who promotes and supports a project. They usually reside within the organization. They, um, they facilitate the work of the project by talking up the project. In other words, uh, this, this is someone who, who, who really wants this project to happen and they when, when it needs resources, so that person might go, go out and say, I really need your best person to be on this project because it's really, really important. That they might do that. And that person who's, who really pushes on it. A lot of times um, when the project manager might be discouraged or might be having a hard time, that project champion is there to push on it, to help, to encourage, to, um, to reward the employees, all of those things. They're, they're the ones that want that project to happen. Work breakdown structure. So a work breakdown structure is a listing of what must be done for a project. So it establishes a logical framework for re, uh, identifying the required activities. So it, it identifies the major elements of the project. It uh, identifies major supporting elements of each of those major elements and the breakdown of the major activities into a list of activities that need to be accomplished. So here's, here's an example work breakdown structure, WBS. You start at the top and there's the project. And you say, well, there's, there's three logical pieces of the project. Let's say that part of the project is a computer, uh, part of the project is software, and uh, part of the project is the user interface or something like that. And then you say, well, so here's the computer. Well, you need a monitor, you need the processor, over here, here's the software. Well, you have to do the requirements, the uh, coding, the testing, and over here is the user interface. So what are the good things you, 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 te you prototype, you get it with the users, and, and then you have the, the final interface. So you just keep breaking the project down into pieces, and that's called a work breakdown structure. Project management decisions. So key manager decisions uh, happen over a sequence of steps. So first you have to decide what projects to implement. Then you select a project manager. Then you select a project team. 
Uh, then you plan and design the project, you manage and control resources, and deciding if and when the project should be terminated. So ideally the project would be terminated when it's done. Sometimes you've, you've worked on it and you find out it's really harder than you thought it was going to be and it really needs to be terminated now. PERT and CPM. So PERT is Program Evaluation and Review Technique and CPM is the Critical Path Method. There are two techniques for um, managing large-scale projects. So with PERT and CPM you get a graphical display of project activities, an estimate of how long the project will take, an indication of which activities are the most critical, and an indication of how long any activity can be delayed without delaying the project, or that's the slack time. So a network diagram. So this is a diagram that shows the sequential relationship of arrows and nodes. So there's a couple of conventions. One is activity on arrow, where the network diagram, the arrow designates activities, and then the other is activity on node. And this is where activities are uh, designated on a node. And events have starting and finishing activities. So here's an example. You can show the same thing. So over here is activity on arrow. So you have something, a starting point, and then you do something, you get to this point, you do something, you get to this point, you do something, you get to this point. In this case, so the activity is A, B, and C. There are activities over here. You do this activity, activity A, and then you go to activity B, and then you do activity C. So um, if you think about uh, going someplace or, or, or moving things, this activity on arrow makes, makes sense. I'm going on a trip. I'm going to start here. I'm going to drive to this point, and then I'm going to drive to this point and drive to this point. That's, that's where activity on arrow makes sense. This is more like I'm, I'm starting in workstation one. When that's done, I'm going to workstation two, and when that's done, I'm going to workstation three. So some of these, this one, A has to be done before B, which has to be done before C. Now this, the second one, is you have A and B have to be done before you can start C. So here you have A and B goes into here and C. Um, this is the other way, activity on node. A has to be done and B has to be done before you start C. Here you have to do A before you can start B and C. A before you start B and C. This is a little bit complicated. Uh, you have to do A and B before you can start C and D. So here's another way of looking at it. You have to do A and B before, so before you can start C you have to do A and B and before you start D you have to do A and B. So those are different networking conventions. So here's an example. So here are paths um, so how many paths, what is the critical path, what is the path with the most slack, and how much slack? So here, this is activity on nodes. So you start, it takes one day to start. Uh, activity A takes four days, and, and you can see that whole network. So let's start out by, by, by doing the paths. So here's path one. You start day one goes, uh, you start with activity A and then you go to active, and, and that takes four days, and then you go to activity D, it takes six days, activity G takes five days, activity I takes seven, seven days, and then you end, it takes one day. So if you look at the length of that path, so path one is start A, D, G, I, end, and the path link is 1 plus 4 plus 6 plus 5 plus 7 plus 1 is 24 days. So you can do this for each of the paths. So here you start out at the top and you say, okay, there's the first path. The second path, you've already gone up here. So you go here and then it goes up and down. The third path, you come down and now you're going to stay high. So you go up here 
and the next path is right here. So you can, you can add each of these, path one, path two, path three, path four, you add them all up, and so path one is 24 days, 23 days, 21 days, and 22 days. So now you start asking the question, what is the critical path? So here, the one with the most days is the critical path. And then the next question is, which path has the most slack? And so here you have, down here you have, path three is 21 days, it has three days of slack. So 24 minus 21 is 20, uh, is, is three days. So time estimates. So one is a determination, deterministic time estimate. This is where you're fairly certain. You're pretty sure that this task is going to take three days. Probabilistic, it allows for variation. So your time estimate is it's going to take two to four days. So then there's a, a couple of methods, early start, early finished. So this is going forward through the network. Uh, if you think about uh, this is, if I start on this date, how does that work? So the earliest st start is the earliest time an activity can start. Um, and it assumes all activities preceding it starts as early as possible. And so for nodes with one entering arrow, the earliest start equals the earliest finish of the entering arrow. For activities with nodes leading, the earliest, or with multiple nodes entering, the earliest start is the largest of the earliest finish coming into it. So the earliest time, uh, the earliest finished is really the earliest start plus the time of the activity. Late start. This is starting at the end and working backwards. And this is really answering the question. Uh, it's, it's backwards scheduling where you say, when's the last I can start on anything? So the latest start, LS, the, the latest time the activity can start and not delay the project. So the latest start equals the latest finish for that block minus the time it takes. So the latest time that an activity can finish and not delay the project um, for nodes leaving one arrow, the latest finish for um, nodes entering equals the time of the latest start of the node leaving. For nodes with multiple leaving arrows, the latest finish for arrows entering the node equals the smallest of the leading arrows. Slack. So there's a couple of ways to compute slack time. So slack equals the latest start minus the earliest start or slack equals the latest finish minus the earliest finish. So if you think about you're working backwards or working forwards, the delta between that for any box is the slack time for that box. Uh, the critical path is any path, if you look at that, with zero slack time. So if there's no slack time, that is a critical path. And you can actually have more than one critical path in a network. So using slack time. So how do you use the slack times? So one of the problems with this is you have multiple boxes. You calculate this. Everybody has slack time, but the manager following you or the manager before you may be counting on that slack time. Uh, <clears throat> so control efforts are directed towards activities that are most successful susceptible to delaying the project. So what is going to delay the project? Put some effort there. And activity slack times are based on the assumption that all activities on the same path will start as early as possible and not exceed their expected time. So if you start as early as possible and they don't exceed their time, you'll get done early and you'll have slack time. If any one of those takes longer than planned, 
then you'll lose slack time. If any one of those start later than planned, you'll lose slack time. Um, if two activities are on the same path and have the same slack time, this will be the total slack time for both. So two activities, when they both say they have 10 days of slack time, what it really means is that one or the other has 10, 10 days of slack time, or they both, if they both use slack time, they'd only have five days each. Probabilistic time estimates. So there's a beta distribution is generally used to describe inherent variability in time estimates. So you can have three approaches, the optimistic time, the length of time required under optim optimal conditions. What's the best time? The pessimistic time is the time with the worst conditions and the most likely time is the most probable length of time. So you could say, well, worst case, it's gonna take two days, I mean, worst case, it's going to take four days, most likely going to take three days, and the most optimistic is one day. So often there's a beta distribution between that optimistic time and the pessimistic time. And so uh, this is the most likely time. So you might use this, you say, well, I'm going to be a little bit pessimistic, not way over here but I'm gonna use this for my estimate, that T and E. Project completion time. A project is not complete until all project activities are complete. So it's risky to only consider the critical path because if you focus on the critical path, something else is gonna get delayed and it's gonna become the critical path. Uh, so, the, so if you determine the probability of completing the project within a, a particular time frame, you calculate the probability that each path on the project will be completed within the specified time and multiply these probabilities. The result is the probability of the project will be completed within the specified time. Time cost trade-offs. So activity time estimates are made for a given level of resources. It may be possible to reduce the duration of the project by injecting additional resources. One example is uh, to avoid late uh, penalties, monetary incentives, uh, free resources for use on other projects. There was once, many years ago, there was an earthquake in Southern California and it shut down a major freeway. Well, they put in uh, incentives in the contract for every day that you finish this freeway sooner uh, you get you get a, a payoff and I don't remember how much let's say it was a million dollars a day it's uh, uh, incentive to be early well one of the things that they when they were calculating the time they figured out the thing on the critical path that was slowing down the 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 project was getting the steel from the steel makers in say Pennsylvania uh, to the, the the site and that came by train and it typically took several you know like maybe a week or two weeks to get that train well they started looking at it and they said well hold it we could charter our own train. In other words, don't take it, let's just have a train dedicated to bringing that steel from the factory straight to the work site. And it, it cost them, let's say it cost them a million dollars to do it that way. But but they saved 10 days and they were getting ten day, a million dollars a day. There was a huge return on investment. It ended up that the project was actually uh, completed faster, it, it, so fast that they got the full reward for the incentive. And, and that's because the incentive was there. They were given the resources to get it done fast. Time cost trade-offs. So there's something called crashing. This is where you shorten activity durations and typically you um, use additional personnel, more equipment or relaxed work specifications, something like that. 
and the project duration may be shortened by increasing direct expenses, but you can realize savings on the indirect project cost. Crashing activities. So here, right here, you have the expected project cost. So the longer the project takes, the more it costs. And then here is what's called crashing activities. These are the cumulative costs of shortening the project. So an example might be if I work overtime on this one piece of critical path, project or if I work overtime on something else and you you get slow uh, uh, less and less <clears throat> so right here if you add those two together the lowest point is the optimum so if you want the lowest cost for this project it's right here at the optimum point PERT advantages. So PERT is the Program Evaluation and Review Technique. It forces the manager to organize and quantify available information and identify where additional information is needed. It provides a graphical display of the project and major activities and identifies which activities should be closely watched and which activities have slack time. So there are sources of error in scheduling. First, the project network may be incomplete. You may have forgotten something that needs to be done and didn't get it in the network. Precedent relationships may not be correctly expressed. So you say that you can't start activity B before A. In reality, you can start it halfway before, or maybe you can start at the same time. Time estimates may be inaccurate. You say that a takes 10 days when it really takes 12. Um, and there's this tense tendency to focus on the critical path. And there's other important things that need to be happening, and you can't just ignore them, even though they're not on the critical path. And major e risk events, the places you have risk, may not be on the critical path. Risk management. So risks are an in inherent part of project management. Uh, risks are related to the occurrence of events that have undesirable consequences. Things like delays, increased cost, inability to meet technical specification. So good risk management starts with identifying as many risks as possible. So it's actually good to sit down with the team, or with individuals have everybody say what what risks where do you have risks you analyze and so you list all those risks then you analyze and assess those risks and then you work to minimize the probability of their occurrence and so you can establish contingency plans and budgets for dealing with any of the risks that actually do occur so here's a <clears throat> probability impact chart. It lists the relative probability of a risk occurring and the relative impact. So here's the likelihood of a risk occurring. So low likelihood, high likelihood, and then the consequence, low consequence, high consequence. And so if it's a, a low consequence, but it's probably going to happen, it's, it's a green risk. If it's a moderate consequence and it, you know, there's a good chance that it will happen, it's a, it's a moderate or yellow risk. And then if it's really bad and really high probability, it's, it's over here, high likelihood, high consequence. And so what you're doing with risk mitigation uh, you're you're reducing you're doing activities that reduce the likelihood so you might have a risk here and you do some activities that bring it down to this level or it might be here bring it down to this level and the idea is you reduce the likelihood you can also reduce the consequence uh, that's often harder because if something happens the consequence tends to stay fixed, but sometimes you can move things to a lower consequence. 
So, so the idea is you want to be moving things into this area with risk management. Summary. So we've talked about projects, the project management triangle, cost, schedule, objectives, all interrelated. And if you try to squeeze them, uh, you end up with lower quality. We talked about work breakdown structure. Then there's the PERT, Program Evaluation and Review Technique, CPM, Critical Path Method. We talked about network diagrams, time estimates, time cost trade-offs and risk management.